Hi, I hope preparing that first paper, which is due March 9th, isn't causing you too much stress, because as we all know, stress causes ulcers, right? That's something we all know. Is it true? No, it turns out. Uh, let me start my brief comments this evening with a book. Okay, that's the book. Seeing what others don't, the remarkable ways we gain insights. And the first thing that uh, we need to know about ulcers is that stress doesn't cause them. I'm not saying stress is a good thing. It's just that, according to physician Barry Marshall, um, the cause of ulcers is a, a bacteria, uh, Helicobacter pylori. And he discovered this back in 1982. And he was completely ostracized by the medical community until in 1994 the medical community or a consensus emerged that he was right. Uh, it's not stress that causes ulcers, it's Helicobacter pylori. pylori. So we, we all know that stress causes ulcers. We know it, but we're wrong. Bear that in mind as I ask you to uh, read the chapter by Stone on efficiency and the chapter from the other book, The Science of Stories, called The Blame Game. And if you're having trouble finding that book or it's too expensive, you know what, just read the article I posted on Plato by the same authors. Uh, check that out. It's, it's roughly the same kind of same kind of analysis about narrative policy framework by Shanahan et al. So let's start with Stone, and in a minute I'll explain why I want you to read these two together in, in some juxtaposition. So Stone on efficiency. Her key point is that efficiency is contestable. Right? It's really important to know where she's coming from. In the first class I think we discussed that she's left of center. And her point in this chapter on efficiency is that efficiency is a, is a contested you know, social construct. It, it's a contested idea. And here's, here's what she says about it um, when she talks about efficiency and markets. The theory she posits is that some people say policies are wrong. They don't like the policies because the policies are inefficient. And what they're really after is more market-based or market policies. So she takes issue with that. Here's what she says. Markets do not work, even on the terms of classical microeconomic theory. But there is an even more important reason to be skeptical of the claims that markets are the best way to organize society. The whole enterprise of prov proving that markets lead to efficiency is predicated on the idea that efficiency is objectively determinable. So she has this idea that uh, some people like markets because they're an efficient way to organize society. I'm not sure who she says thinks that, but that's kind of the, that's the premise of her critique of efficiency as it's used in public policy uh, discussion, in public policy discourse, that the people who talk about efficiency uh, are really just pushing markets and markets are not efficient. She says markets do not work. That's her, uh, that's her political belief. Okay, so it's important to know that that is her political belief when we think about what she has to say about efficiency. It doesn't mean that what she says about efficiency is wrong, doesn't mean that it's right. It's just it's useful to know that's where she's coming from. She does not like markets. Um, and what, where does that lead her? The other part of the efficiency chapter I want you to focus on is this comment. If we start from the premise that efficiency itself is a contestable idea about what constitutes social welfare, then the best way to organize society to achieve efficiency is to provide a democratic governing structure that allows for these contests to be expressed and addressed in a fair way. So she's got you know, her own agenda. And I bring this to your attention, again, not so that you disregard what she says or discount it. I just want you to bear in mind that she has her own political point of view it's useful to know that when we're reading what she has to say about efficiency. What does that have to do with the other reading for this week by Shanahan et al. on uh, na the narrative policy framework? Well, one of the things that the NPF, narrative policy framework, scholars do really well, I think, is that they show that narrative is a tool. Policy advocates use narrative as a tool in order to problematize things, to take a phenomenon and say this is a problem 
and then to present a policy, uh, maybe an underlying policy or a, a different set of events as the cause. So they use narrative to uh, claim that there's a problem, to problematize a phenomena. They use narrative to say what the cause of that problem is, and they use narrative to um, push their policy solution. So that's what MPF is about. That's MPF in a nutshell. They, they explain that narrative is a policy tool. So what Shanahan et al. do in, in the blame game and the other article I posted is they look at how uh, advocates, exactly how advocates go about this task, and they use bison, okay, a controversy around bison as the example. So there's a, a group that doesn't like the way the National Park Service manages bison, and the group is called, let me just refresh my memory, the, um, the, the bison field, the bison field campaign. It's, it's a pressure group, and they really don't like the way the National Park Service and the, uh, the state government in Montana treats bison. So uh, this campaign posts a lot of videos on YouTube. It's been doing it since about 2010, according to Shanahan and the other authors. What Shanahan and the authors did is look at those videos, those bison field campaign videos, and analyze them in terms of uh, the, the components, the narrative components, like hero, villain, control, helplessness, from helplessness to control, what the plot is, what the, nar what the narrative arc is. So they analyze these videos and they really break it down and they code them and they discuss them and they reach some conclusions. So it, either read the blame game or the article. If you have time and access to them both, please do read both. And I think what you'll find is that um, narrative is a very important part of policy production. I just want you to know that. Um, what I really want you to think about is how narrative gets deployed in policy analysis, how it can stand in the way of policy analysis. One of the points that Shanahan et al. make after they've analyzed all these videos in terms of narrative policy framework is they point out that when you uh, treat the people on the other side as as fundamentally wrong, when you when you demonize them, it makes it that much harder to converse with them. That demonizing people has a polarizing effect, and it leads to intractability, and increases the difficulty of civic discourse. No kidding, right? <laughs> Who'd have thought that? So they point this out. This is this is a good thing. They point out that when you demonize your opponents, which is, is an important component of narrative in policy advocacy, unfortunately, uh, it tends to make problems intractable, tends to get people entrenched, and makes it more difficult to reach across the aisle and converse and solve real problems, if you can agree with the other side what the problems are. So read those articles, think about them, and then think about you know, whether this is an accident. Spoiler alert, no it's not. Uh, some advocates are very intentional about this, they're very deliberate about it. Um, in your studies so far, you may have come across the work of Saul Alinsky. Remember, he's the guy who wrote that book in 1971 called Rules for Radicals. I hadn't heard of it until I started teaching as adjunct at UMass, and some real professors uh, were talking about this book in a let me put it mildly, in, in a non-critical way. They were praising the book, Rules for Radicals, and uh, kind of suggesting it, was, it would be a great handbook for policy advocates. It should be a handbook for policy advocates. And um, let me be clear about this. I do not feel that way. I feel very strongly the opposite way about Rules for Radicals. Um, and let me read you some of the rules, and then you maybe will get a sense of why I feel this way, and why I just... I don't necessarily want you to agree with me. I just want you to bear in mind that this is uh, very often no accident that policy advocates who demonize the opposition uh, use what Shanahan et al. refer to as devil shift. Um, people do this deliberately. It's not an oops moment. Oops, I've gone and demonized the opposition. Oops, I've gone and made my opponents look like uh, less than human and unworthy of uh, civic discourse. No, it, it, it's a deliberate 
process. So be mindful of that. And uh, if you have a minute, check out Rules for Radicals. Here, here are some of them. Uh, one of Alinsky's rules is this, whenever possible, go outside the experience of the enemy. And when he refers to the enemy, he means political opponents. He doesn't mean uh, people who are actually trying to kill you. He, when he says enemy, means uh, people with whom you disagree. People who have a different political opinion from you. He says, whenever possible, go outside the experience of the enemy. Here you want to cause confusion, fear, and retreat. He says, ridicule is man's most potent weapon. His 13th rule, you may have heard about this. Pick the target, freeze it, personalize it, and polarize it. He's talking about other human beings here. And uh, I'll leave you with this one, one of his other comments in Rules for Radicals. One acts decisively only in the conviction that all the angels are on one side and all the devils are on the other. Now, there's something fundamentally wrong with you if you actually believe that. Okay, But that is uh, the basis for, for much uh, policy, na what passes for policy, pol policy narrative advocacy. Okay, let's get back to uh, Shanahan et al. and the bison. Look at the bison videos if you have time. The bison field campaign videos. Watch some of them and see what narrative techniques they use. And then think about the actual problem that the National Park Service and state government in Montana says it's trying to solve. So bison field campaign says there is no problem. There's not really a problem. They're not trying to solve it. Look into that. Look at what the National Park Service says the problem is. It has to do with the disease. It's a, it's a disease that causes cattle to miscarry. And the National Park Service says they get this disease from bison. So they try to control and manage bison, keep them uh, away from uh, livestock, prevent more encounters between livestock and bison. So that's the problem the National Park Service says it's been trying to solve. And ask yourself this. If you wanted to test the validity of that uh, policy goal, what do you need to know? What do you need to know about the disease? What do you need to know about bison? What do you need to know about livestock? And how would you go about finding out? Ask yourself the kind of questions that I'm asking you to ask in your policy analysis papers. You know, what's, what's the truth here? And I realize that this is, this is now a somewhat uh, controversial question to ask in academia. What, you know, what is the truth? But that's what I'm asking you to do. Find out what is objectively, verifiably true. What's real? So do that with... Um, the, the bison issue. Look at the bison field campaign videos, read the article uh, by Shanahan et al, and then do a little research. Don't spend much time with it, but, you know, do a bit of googling and find out who is saying what about the particular disease that the National Park Service and the Montana state government says uh, gets transmitted by bison to cattle. And then ask yourself, well, you know, is this a problem that needs solving? And is the solution the National Park Service is engaged in, it engages in uh, hazing and culling and trying to move bison away from livestock. Is that uh, a, an appropriate policy solution? Does it help solve the problem if you conclude that there is in fact a problem? And the reason I ask you to think about bison as opposed to people is next step is people, okay? We've been talking a little in class about the issue of the opioid crisis. And, uh, you know, who says it's a problem and who says it, it, it's not? Um, what's the reality of, uh, of addiction? What's the reality of, of the death toll? And what's really happening in terms of the cause of the opioid crisis? Why do some people get addicted to opioids? Uh, do some people move from opioids to, say, black tar heroin? If so, why? We're trying to find out what's really going on here because you cannot fashion a a proper policy response until you know what the cause causes of the phenomena are. So that that's my position. I think this is what I believe that in order to fashion a, a proper policy response, you should find out what the cause of the phenomena is. You cannot fix something unless you know what the problem is. And that way you get a handle on how to analyze a policy. So policy analysis is about 
determining the efficacy of policies, public policies that have been enacted or public policies that are being proposed by policy advocates. Okay, And that's the choice you have, by the way. You have a choice. You can either pick a policy that's already law, that's already embodied in law or regulation, or a policy that somebody is proposing should become law, a policy proposal. Those are, the, those are your choices for analysis. Fields wide open. Some of you may pick um, the opioid crisis. I know that some of you are. I know that some of you are leaning toward things like minimum wage, um, and that's a, a great subject because there's a wealth of economic literature out there on what um, the effects of a minimum wage and if minimum wage increases are on different parts of the population. So I think you'll have a lot of luck studying minimum wage and studying the opioid crisis and um, policies that are posited as responses to the opioid crisis. So read the articles and um, check out the discussion board. Any questions, please email me or give me a call, preferably email me, and I'll see you next time.